um, representatives of Civic Scotland and uh, election nominees, uh, party nominees, and Lord Smith of Kelton. Welcome. Uh, my name is Richard Scothorn, and um, I've been asked to be the independent facilitator uh, for this session. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to start off with. Because it can interfere with broadcasting, uh, could everyone please turn phones off or to flight mode? Thank you very much. Now, in a minute, I'm going to set out uh, the ground rules for our discussion. Um, but I would like um, to allow the political nominees an, an opportunity to introduce themselves uh, to the representative of Civic Scotland we have. <coughs> today, so Linda, if I could start with you, please. Uh, my name is Linda Fabiani, and I'm one of the, the SNP nominees to the Commission, along with John Swinney. My name is uh, Michael Moore, a uh, Liberal Democrat uh, representative on uh, the Commission, and uh, I was reflecting with Linda earlier on that upstairs, the last time I was in that room, she was cross-examining me about the Scotland Bill. Um, so we're glad to be on the same side, at least at the moment. <laughs> Uh, Robert Smith, and uh, I'm chairing the commission. Uh, I'm Ian Gray, MSP. I'm one of the Labour nominees. And Maggie Chapman, one of the Green nominees, with Patrick Harvey, who's upstairs. Uh, good morning. I'm Adam Tompkins, one of the Conservative nominees, along with uh, Annabel Goldie, who's also, I think, upstairs. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Now, um, ground rules for uh, discussion today are uh, fairly straightforward. We've got submissions uh, setting out what you would like to see devolved or not devolved from many of you. Um, so what we don't want to do is to spend time on uh, setting out uh, those again. What we do want to focus upon, uh, as Lord Smith said in, in his introduction, is, is the whys and the hows. It's an opportunity for the political nominees to explore what, what lies behind the proposals you've made. Uh, so the whys why powers will strengthen the Scottish Parliament uh, within the UK, and the hows, uh, how they will uh, meet the principles established by the Commission, um, and any practical issues that may arise from this. So that is what I would like us to focus upon, and that's what I'll um, ask you to focus upon. Now, I'm very conscious uh, time is tight, um, both in the overall agenda and certainly today, um, and there's a lot that I would like to cover. There's a lot in your uh, submissions that I'm sure the political nominees will want to explore with you. Uh, so I'm keen to, that we don't get drawn into dis discussion of detail, um, and um, I spend time on a particular issue, so I will move the discussion on to make sure we can cover as many points as possible. Um, we also uh, need to focus upon powers rather than uh, policy. In other words, really understanding uh, what issue the powers are tackling and the opportunities that powers will create for Scotland. Um, but clearly, in terms of if, if we are identifying policy issues for Scotland that require changes of powers, then that, is, that is also very relevant to our discussion today. Uh, we're going to ch chunk the uh, discussion into three pieces this morning. Uh, first of all, on governance, how to create a lasting, responsive, uh, se democratic settlement for Scotland. Uh, strengthen the financial accountability um, of the Parliament. And then tackling issues around uh, prosperity, jobs, and social justice. And I'd like to spend more time on that final one than on the rest, um, because there is a lot to cover everything from work and welfare and employability through to broadcasting. So I'm going to try and manage the time so we have the biggest chunk at the end. Right, is that all clear? Thank you very much. Right, uh, at the beginning of each section, I'm going to ask a, an initial question just to get the discussion going. And then I'll, I'll pass across to the political nominees to uh, follow up with, with their own questions. Um, but on the first one, I wonder if I could ask um, Margaret Lynch uh, of Citizen Advice Scotland. Margaret, uh, you've talked a lot in your submission about the relationship between the two parliaments uh, and the quality of that relationship and the structures needed to build on that uh, and ensure there's a reasonable Scottish voice within that. I wonder if you could take us a bit through the reasons behind that and the opportunities that you think there are to do that better. <clears throat> um, yes, um, and, and thank you for inviting us to contribute um, to the Smith Commission and to do today's discussion. Our experience as Citizens Advice, um, because we deal with issues and problems that people bring to us that are legislated for by the UK Parliament, 
and by the Scottish Parliament, um, I think gives us an insight into um, how well the parliaments and the governments work together and also the level of engagement that there is with Scottish stakeholders, particularly on reserved matters. I think the observation that, that we would make, um, and to some degree it's an anecdotal one, um, is that in 1999, when this parliament was set up, um, there was a kind of gear shift happened in Westminster, both um, in relation to the parliament, but also in relation to um, the civil service. And <clears throat> you did not get the level of stakeholder engagement with Scottish um, voices on reserved matters that there had been prior to the establishment of this parliament. And to a degree, I think we were also delighted that this parliament was here. We probably didn't pick up on it because there were lots of issues that we wanted to engage with here. Um, what we are now finding is that organisations like the Financial Conduct Authority stand out because they do engage with Scottish stakeholders, they come up to Edinburgh, they have consultation meetings here, and they are behaving in a way that's radically different from other parts of, of, of government. Um, I think a lot of this is probably to do with the fact that it's easier to um, engage with stakeholders that have London offices that are more easily accessible. We have a sister organisation in England and Wales called Citizens Advice. And um, I presume it's easier for um, government and civil servants to talk to them because they're round the corner. Um, but I think that that has a really a, a deleterious impact on not just the making of government policy, but the implementation of it because the context in Scotland can often be different. And the way in which policies impact on people in Scotland can be different from the way that it, it, they do down south. We can give you examples of where failure to consult with Scottish stakeholders has actually defeated what the government has been trying to do. I appreciate you don't want to get into the, difficult, you know, the detail here, but that has happened and that is of concern to us. We also are acutely aware that most of the problems that people bring to our door require joined up action between the governments. You know, child poverty, I presume, is not something that only one section of the population or one political party wants to attend to, whilst there might be differences of approach and opinion. Um, I, one of the things that we would really like to see is a conversation at a ministerial level, some joint strategies being developed by the UK government, by the Scottish government and crucially by local government as well, that align behind reducing child poverty, reducing inequality and um, just generally uh, improving um, people's well-being. And we don't see those kind of interactions taking place at the moment. Margaret. Um, Adam Tompkins. Adam, I wonder if I could ask you for any questions on this particular area of, of governance and constitution. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, I mean, that's extremely um, helpful. Thank you, Margaret. The, um, um, so uh, the, the two uh, issues that you raise are um, uh, st stakeholder en engagement and consultation on the one hand and cooperation between the governments on the other. And those are obviously, you know, quite um, uh, distinguishable uh, issues. Each of them is important. Um, ha ha I suppose, as I mean, I don't want to ask too sort of formalist a question. Um, and of course, my background is as a constitutional lawyer. Um, but how could we legislate for either of these to be made better? Is it the case that is it is it the case is it your is it your view that there is something that we could do in terms of lawmaking um, uh, that would uh, ensure uh, either? Um, greater uh, consultation, more effective consultation, um, or more effective cooperation between the governments, or is it a matter of, of practice? Is it something that needs to emerge through the mm -hmm. through the culture of of civic engagement? Mm -hmm. um, and, and if it's the latter, then I mean I don't mean this defensively, but what can we do about it? What can we, the Smith Commission, recommend that the United Kingdom Parliament does about it in terms of what goes into the next Scotland Bill? Mm. Um, I think you're absolutely, I mean, your question's germane. I do not think that it requires legislation to sort this out. What it requires is common sense um, and a degree of a, a, maybe a more collaborative approach. 
um, to tackling some of the big issues of the day. I would imagine the way that you would organise around about this issue would be to have some kind of framework agreement between um, the UK and Scottish governments, which would set out the modalities of how um, you know these, these issues are tackled. My expectation of the Smith Commission is to identify areas where legislation is required, where more powers are required, but frankly also to call out um, deficiencies um, and where the current system is not being used or the flex in the current system isn't being used in the way that it could be because of perhaps an adversarial approach to politics which you know universally doesn't help anybody so is it is it, is it your sense then that the that it's not the problem so it's not so much the problem that the that the system is defective uh, currently but that the current system is not being effectively used by the various um, by the various parties? Um, I think that both, I would say, are true. Right. The, um, I mean, if you, if you look at the other parts of our submission, we argue that there are areas where okay. legislation is required and further powers okay. need to be devolved okay. to Can Scotland. I but with respect to this particular um, area, we think that you could go a fair distance um, by just improving um, the way that the two, the, the two governments relate to each other and the way that, crucially, the civil services relate to each other and the way that they relate to Scottish stakeholder organisations across the board. Okay. So if, if, can we focus on the bits of the piece where you think it's the system that's broken rather than, or well, the system that's not good enough, rather than the operators not using the system effectively enough? What, what are the systemic changes that you would like us so to... I would like there to be a, a, a one systemic change. I would like there to be a requirement on all um, sort of governments and, and crucially civil servants as well to frankly, you know, get their backsides up to Scotland and engage with people up here. I think we need to beef up the, the role of the, the Scotland office. But there should be no policy, no new policy that government are discussing that hasn't been consulted upon in Scotland. I'll give you an example. A consumer bill went through um, Westminster. There was no consultation with any Scottish stakeholders. And yet, although we were allowed to submit, uh, we were you know, allowed to put in submissions, um, there was no uh, there was no ability for anybody in Scotland, in Scotland, to to engage with that process and that policy making process. Similarly, if you look at welfare reform, um, from a, an implementation point of view, there needs to be you know more consultation in Scotland, um, so that people and pe people and organisations are able to engage. So I would go for a statutory requirement to consult with Scottish stakeholders and you know, and in Scotland. The other thing is that there are funding mechanisms that are used that disadvantage Scottish stakeholders. So, for example, the funding that comes to the Citizens Advice Service across the board for engaging with the Westminster Parliament goes exclusively to Citizens Advice England and Wales, who do not speak for Scotland. And there's no funding mechanism that comes to us in Scotland. So we cannot, we do not have the resource to send people down to Westminster or to, to even know, for example, that there's a consumer bill that's coming on and that that's going to have an, you know, an impact on consumers in Scotland because we're not resourced to do that. The resource is applied purely in England and Wales, and that's not a legislative issue. It's, it's an issue of planning and attention to detail and political will. I'd like to bring some other voices in here. Uh, first of all, Mark Ballard from Barnardo's, and then uh, Bill Scott, if I may. Uh, from Inclusion Scotland, Mark. Uh, thank you. And um, like Margaret, I'd like to thank the Commission and the, the political parties represented on the Commission for inviting Bernardo's to give evidence. Bernardo's is a UK-wide organisation. We have policy teams in uh, not only working in Holyrood and Westminster, but also in Stormont and Cardiff Bay. And I echo many of Margaret's concerns, but something that we find happens is that because my colleagues at Westminster talk to me and colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland, they're sometimes better informed than the civil servants that they're talking to at Westminster about the particular issues for, in Scotland where the matter is um, a reserved Westminster matter or particular Scottish contexts where 
parts of the issues for discussion are devolved or wholly devolved. And I think there's a, an, an issue about the lack of formal structures that bring together all four parliaments, all four civil service institutions, so that they can learn from best practice in different nations. So when one of those civil service structures, typically Westminster, has a competence that is UK-wide or Great Britain-wide, that actually there's a reflection on how this will interface with other responsibilities which are devolved to Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. And I think there's a lack of formal structures there, which means that at times it is third sector bodies like Bernardo's that operate UK-wide that act, can actually advise the civil servants. So there's something about those formal structures. The other thing, though, and I don't want to stray too much into the, the territory of the third area, um, the, the third topic for discussion is where we have competences where there's a very unclear borderline between the responsibilities, it exacerbates the confusion. When you have a situation where welfare, um, welfare funds are a local authority, Scottish Parliament responsibility, but hardship funds are a Job Centre Plus DWP responsibility, you get, from the point of view of those who are trying to access services, the confusion. And so I think addressing where we have structures in legislation, um, whether it's uh, the work programme not meshing neatly with um, the employability, the training and skills work of the Scottish Parliament, those create and exacerbate those confusions. And a governance structure which has more of those complicated areas where governance is, is, is in practice unclear will create more complexity and a clearer governance structure would reduce that complexity. Thank you so much. We will return obviously to the whole issue of welfare and, and benefits uh, later on in discussion. Bill Scott, uh, Inclusion uh, Scotland, can I draw you in please? Thank you and thanks uh, as well from ourselves for the invitation <coughs> to contribute to today's discussion. It's just really a very small point and it is um, really backing up what Margaret said, that uh, the DWP are obviously a UK-wide department. Uh, the Office for Disability Issues is based within the DWP. Um, a fund was started up by the Office for Disability <coughs> Issues called uh, Disabled People, People's User-Led Organisation Fund. Um, and for the first year of its existence, it was only open to organisations in England and Wales. It was only when we raised the fact that Scottish disabled people's organisations were not being allowed to access this fund that that was actually changed. And this is, I think this is one of the, the problems that, that remains with UK-wide departments that begin to think that you know, the territory isn't, doesn't include Scotland or Northern Ireland. You know, and, uh, and therefore, it, it's not, I, don't, I don't think it was anything deliberate in our exclusion from that fund. I think it was you know, an error of where the remit fell. And um, you know, once they were reminded that the remit actually did include Scotland, they opened up the fund. But you know, for a year, um, Scottish organisations couldn't get access to that fund. There's a similar sort of issue around access to elected office fund, um, where again, disabled people who are trying to become political candidates, local government, Westminster are supported from that fund in England and Wales, um, but not in Scotland. Uh, uh, sorry, if they're going to be local government or Holyrood in Scotland, they're not supported. If they're going to Westminster, yeah. But you know, again, there's a bit of disjunction there. Um, I'm not really sure why it's, it's felt that Holyrood shouldn't be included in, in, in that fund. Um, you know, when it, the, the purpose is to get more disabled people into positions where they can influence policy. Thanks, Bill. Uh, John Downey from SCVO. Thanks, Richard. I think in, in some sense we need to take a step back here. I mean, it's easy to congratulate ourselves that with the turnout in the referendum and the engagement that, you know, our democracy is in a healthy position. Well, frankly, it isn't because only 50% of people voted in the last Scottish Parliament election. I mean, last year, in terms of a number of by-elections at local government level, we had less than 20% of people engaging in the process. So there actually is some fundamental questions, which I accept are perhaps out with the remit of the Smith Commission, which we need to be considering. And, and that's why I think in our submission we laid on you know, governance and democracy issues as a lead-up to this, because actually 
the issues that Mark and uh, Margaret have, have talked about, you need to think about where is the appropriate level of power that you know, it should be held in Scotland. And I'm thinking about, it's not just the issue of giving more powers to the Scottish Parliament. What are we talking about in terms of local government? And there's a debate about the role of local government in the future. There's actually how do we give more powers to people and communities? Because and the fact is, you know, we can look at the figures in poverty and inequality in Scotland, and we know part of that answer is giving people much more say over their own lives and control. Now, how we do that, I accept, is a very difficult and there's, there's no perfect model. But I think we need to take a step back and think about the governance of our country. I know, uh, if I take the Labour point of view, it's the, the double devolution. We, we need to think about where all the powers we're talking about should lie best to actually do it. And I think you know, we can get caught up on the powers and how they work together. But actually, and Adam, you mentioned that there's, there's a big cultural issue we need to overcome about how we do things as well. Ian Mackay from Institute of Directors. I wanted to harden up the points that I think very helpfully Margaret was making, because even from our side of the defence as well, most of us on this side of the horseshoe did not wish to become involved in the referendum debate on partisan grounds. But we are very keen to have our, our voice heard now that we're actually involved in, in this part of the discussion. And I think it's important that some of the very welcome developments that we saw at that time are continued. For example, for the first time, the Treasury establishes an office in Scotland, surprisingly when the referendum campaign is taking, taking place. We had uh, government offices, uh, House of Lords committees and so on, meeting up here, had never met here before. We had an engagement there that, that from them, far less from uh, the general public, uh, that we hadn't seen before. We have to retain those. And I think it's important that at different periods since this parliament was established, uh, we have seen both at times when the same party was in command in, in both uh, Whitehall and Holyrood, and when different parties were there, a reticence to work together and um, you know, more of a, 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 an attitude of almost fighting each other for party advantage. And from our side of the fence, that is unhelpful. It is most helpful to us when, for example, in my area, if biz are doing things that are useful for the promotion of good business practices, that should be being promoted in Scotland as much as anywhere else. And similarly, if the Scottish government is doing something, it sh they should seek to dovetail that with the activities that are happening in the UK, because that will be for the good of all if that actually takes place. And I think that I, I suspect that line which Margaret was establishing there about the need for the two governments to work together is one that probably all of us on this side would share. Um, Adam? Can I just come back in on this? Um, I'm sure other members of the also want to say something about it. But, um, I, I mean, look, um, ever since devolution was created in uh, the Scotland Act 1998, um, uh, th what, is, what we've just heard has been said. Uh, you can read the Kalman report in 2009, and there's a big chunk of the Kalman report that says that we need more joined-up cooperative arrangements between the Scottish Parliament and the UK Parliament, between the Scottish Civil Service and the UK Civil Service, and between Scottish ministers um, and the UK ministers. Uh, so this it, it is, is not a new problem, um, uh, and it's not a newly expressed problem either. Um, uh, Kalman didn't fix it because you're still talking about it, and you're not alone. Um, so what can we practically do? in terms of making our recommendations in our heads of agreement uh, to the UK government uh, that will fix this, that will ensure that there is, instead of, instead of just saying that there ought to be uh, more cooperative arrangements between the parliaments, between the civil servants and between the ministers, that there actually are put in place more. What, what would these cooperative arra arrangements look like? What would be required um, in legislation to ensure that these cooperative ar arrangements happen? And what would be the legal consequences of a failure of them to happen if these are matters which are now enshrined in statute? Would somebody be able to go to court and say that the Consumer Rights Bill should not be allowed to proceed any further in the House of Commons because you've overlooked the statutory obligation to consult uh, in Scotland? Is that the kind of recommendation that you're looking for? Ian. Um, I, I to be clear... A point, Adam, because, uh, I mean, I think... I think the implication from colleagues is that there's not a conspiracy here, it's more cock-up and um, a, a lack of understanding. But, but one of the things that I thought 
was quite interesting in Margaret's opening remarks was you implied or said, I think, Margaret, that this had actually got worse because of devolution, that you implied that prior to devolution, perhaps it was more obvious, I don't know, to UK-wide departments that Scotland and Wales was part of um, what they should be taking into consideration. But it's also true that even in those days, some of the context in Scotland would be different depending on what sector you're in, even though it wasn't devolved. And I guess the, uh, some of how that happened properly was that in those days the Scottish office was quite a big uh, undertaking. And you mentioned in your remarks the Scotland office, which is now quite a small undertaking in which you know, Michael's been involved and I've been involved in a different capacity in the past. So, I mean, I think Adam's right. We need to try and focus, I guess, for us, our thinking a little bit on what are the frameworks or where is the place in government or the, the place where the two, uh, two governments or two parliaments come together that we can maybe change something or suggest a change to something. I just wonder if you think the Scotland office has got a role in that, because you kind of implied that you thought it did, but it wasn't perhaps um, making that work in the way that you would like. Uh, Ian Mackay, I think you are going to uh, attempt to answer Adam and Ian's questions, and then I'm going to bring in uh, Ross Martin, and, and then Michael Moore, and then John Downey. Chair, I was certainly keen that, that we don't get back into throwing words at each other. We were trying to be very practical, um, and you know, the parties, I think, have to listen with open ears to that. What I was saying was the Treasury Office was established here during the campaign keep the Treasury Office here. The Treasury Office produced a whole bunch of what some might have regarded as slightly partisan documentation and data and so on. However, it was good data and data that is useful for all of us. Keep that data flow coming. Make the Scotland Office a real thing. Make it the gateway for a whole bunch of uh, uh, activities that take place uh, in Whitehall, in my own area of work, particularly in biz, so that those departments and those programmes which are happening there are directly accessible and are pushed in Scotland by a department which has that job to do. And Scottish Government and that part of Scotland office work together. So I'm not saying, oh, it would be nice. I'm saying, do that. Those are the practical things to do. It's not a discussion. It's a suggestion that says, here are practical, ordinary things that have happened, and even better, have a wee think about whether there's other things like that that could be done. Because I think, you know, those were good things that have, that have been good developments and there's things that we need to see more of. Uh, Ross Martin, SCDI, I think you are keen to come in. A specific example of a much more generic issue uh, in terms of um, what the Commission's about and how it's going to put together a package which is going to find resonance out there amongst the population. Um, a, a dry package of powers or power transfer isn't going to cut the mustard with the population. There's going to have to be some some sprinkling of magic dust in some way. And that means necessarily spending some of your time talking about uh, relationships and people rather than just structures and systems. Um, and so the, the solution to this particular problem is you'll find unan unanimity around this table uh, in terms of the, the level of frustration at the lack of people's ability. And I wouldn't call it a conspiracy, Ian, but I would, it's, a, it's a result of chosen behaviours which people have decided that that's how they're going to behave or not behave. And so the, the lack of integration between the, the two parliaments and the two governments is a result of people actually deciding that that's what they're going to do. And in answer to your earlier question, Adam, about what can you do about that, you're doing it today because you're here in this building and you're integrating in a way which UK bodies and Scottish bodies haven't done in the past. So, you know, one example that we highlight in our submission, the Scottish Select Committee should meet in this building. It is ridiculous that it doesn't meet in this building. And there should be an, an ability for people like us around the table to engage with that uh, particular um, group uh, and a whole range of others. And so there's, there's, that, there's just that magic dust about relationships and people that somehow you need to reflect, albeit that your focus has to be on the transfer of power. Uh, Michael Moore and then Linda Fabiani. Yeah, building on uh, Ian's observation earlier on, uh, both he and I know uh, what the modern Scotland office is like, and I know from uh, many of you around the table here and colleagues upstairs, um, you know, how challenging uh, it was 
uh, remains to represent the UK <coughs> Government in Scotland with the amount of time and resource that is available to the Scotland office. On the practical steps, I mean, I was very encouraged by what uh, everybody has said so far. Margaret put her finger on it right at the start, and Adam has tried to tease this out a bit. Uh, uh, would a statutory right of consultation for representative bodies in the devolved areas of the United Kingdom begin to address practically the issues that you've talked about and that Bill brought up in terms of funding access so that there is a presumption that all parts of the United Kingdom are appropriately considered. Uh, you know, we make your judgments later about how well their thoughts have been taken on board, but at least that they are approached and dealt with. And in terms of structures of government, I mean, uh, my colleagues have heard me uh, go on about this a little bit already uh, without telling tales out of school. Um, there is a system of committees, the joint ministerial committees, between UK and uh, devolved administration ministers, uh, which um, the better bits of it work well, but vast areas of UK policymaking are not represented in them other than under the derisory title of the Home Committee that will consider everything from welfare to energy to culture, media and sport when it becomes relevant. Um, having m greater formality about that, would that help to drive the system, do you believe? Um, it doesn't quite bring the human face uh, that uh, Ross has been mentioning just now, um, but it would, it seems to me, perhaps lead us in the right direction. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Lin oh, sorry, Mary. I'd, I'd like to make, uh, we're straying way beyond the SFHA submission on this uh, terrain, but just to, to make a point here that I think I would echo what's been said already uh, in, entirely, and I think in pursuit of the magic dust uh, argument, I think I want to make the point that I th uh, the, the issues are as much cultural and ignorance and neglect. And so what needs to be put in place is some kind of mechanism that combats that. Um, and that requires it to happen, because once the dialogue starts, I'm confident that it would actually produce uh, better understanding and, and more attention to the differences. Um, at, but it, but it's, it's, it's cultural at root, and so you need structural mechanisms to start to combat some of that. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Yeah, I, I think what I'm a wee bit concerned about in this discussion is that we're talking about, so far, making the status quo work better. And when, you know, we're looking at what we're trying to achieve here, and I look at my experience in different committees with, with some of the same people that are here sitting around, very often it's not just about consultation and participation about what is happening, but it is back to the cultural thing that Mary was talking about, a lack of recognition of differences in Scotland. Um, not just the fluffy stuff about how we do things, but very structural differences. And, and I would bring in, on the back of Mary, the, the bedroom tax, uh, for example, the sheer impracticality of implementing something like that because the infrastructure was not there to be allowed to implement it and there was absolutely no recognition of that at all in any participation consultation discussion with the UK government, um, Scottish government, or indeed... Uh, the people that are directly involved. So I'm just very keen to make sure that we're not just talking about structures here, we are talking about additional powers so that things that are implemented, that are um, whatever comes out of this commission and the UK government, still the responsibility of the UK government, have a recognition that sometimes things here are very, very different. Um, Maggie Chapman, I'm going to bring you in, and then uh, John Downey from SCVA. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Um, th thank you all for your contribution so far. Listen, and Lin I was going to make very much the same point that Linda has, has just made. I think it's, it's interesting to hear your, your conversation and, and, and your, your notions of you know, that, that, that magic dust and, and the need for, for a cultural sh shift. Mary, you talked about mechanisms for dealing with uh, 
I issues like neglect or, or, and, and, and that kind of thing. And I'm wondering what your views are. Generally, um, Mark and Margaret both, both mentioned the different levels of, of government that we have. And I'm wondering uh, what you think about how, sp speaking, I suppose, as, as a, as a councillor, how local government and um, that, that level of, of governance interacts with the Scottish Parliament and, and therefore additionally with um, Westminster. Because if we think of these structures as quite distinct and quite finite, I think we, we're going to run into difficulties. And it's going to be, as Linda says, just making what we've got or trying to make what we've got work better rather than radically changing our whole approach to understanding what governance is. And I'm wondering whether you, you could just say a little bit more about how you see some of the structural barriers between those three levels of governance that we have at the moment and how we can actually break, break some of those down and what mechanisms we might, we might use to achieve that in legislation, in, in the sort of tangible things that, that we can deal with as part of the Commission. Mary Taylor. Um, I, I think I would like more time than we will have this morning or in the next two weeks, potentially even, uh, to come back to you on the detail of that. And I'm sure others would, would chime with that and welcome the opportunity to have a, a further go at what the mechanisms might be. I think you could usefully get to a point where you recognise by the end of this month that mechanisms are required. You've had some kind of, I, I think, pretty much off the cuff around the table this morning. Um, I haven't read everyone's submissions, for which I apologise. Um, but, but I'm sure we can come up with something if there's a will to make it work. Um, let me go back to the bedroom tax. I think there is an issue here um, which, which makes the point nicely that, that you're driving at, um, where local government and housing associations were expected to... Uh, uh, in effect, move people around the country in order, uh, or, or just uh, accept a cut in rents, or you know, I don't know what exactly the intention was, um, but but uh, and local government was meant to administer housing benefit um, in a framework that was determined by Westminster without cooperation from Holyrood necessarily, with some objections being made from the third sector, by local government and by um, local government itself. Um, so, so I, I think we need to get to a point where if a policy is expected to work in a part of, in a jurisdiction of the country, that it has the opportunity to, uh, to, to comment at some point formally about whether it is workable in that area. The bedroom tax was egregiously an area which, where it wasn't going to work as it was set out. Uh, and, and we said in our evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee in July 2012, that it was a policy that was designed for London um, and it wasn't going to work in Scotland. And it's wreaked havoc. And, and thank goodness that havoc has been averted by the fact that the Scottish Parliament has chosen, with cross-party agreement, um, to put money into mitigation. But that's, that's a direct impact on the Scottish Parliament's use of its own um, fiscal powers as a result of the failure of the UK government to effectively listen to anything that anybody in Scotland was saying. So. Um, I'm conscious we need to come to the end of this section very soon. I'm just going to leave the last word with John Downey and then with Bill Scott, please. Thanks, Richard. In picking up, I think, a couple of points that, that Michael made, and I think the framework, Michael, I think are, the frameworks are there in position at the moment. They're actually just not being used very effectively in terms of the point that Linda made about the respect between governments and consideration of, of diff what works in different parts of the country, because... You know, uh, bedroom tax is a good example. I mean, we've got Wales and Northern Ireland who are having issues with it. It's Scotland and northeast of England as well. So it's not it's not particular to to Scotland. And I think, Michael, one of the things that you were talking about there is, you know, your own experience in Ian with the Scotland office. The Scotland office used to be a significant department that was resourced to actually work in Scotland and work with the people of Scotland. Actually, in the last you know ten years, that has not been the case and I think the Scotland office does need significant increase in resources to be able to to act as a conduit in the doorway for private sector in Scotland, the public sector and the third sector to the London department, to ministers to do some of the stuff that we're, we're talking about here. Otherwise it's not going to work and I think picking up on Maggie's point, this is I think our key debate here is we were talking about a transfer of power from uh, the UK to the Scottish Parliament. Actually, what we need a bigger debate on, and, a, and I think the Smith Commission will engender that as we go forward, is where should powers sit? Once the Scottish Parliament gets them, what should they be devolving to local government, and what's the role, and actually people... So I think that we need to 
break out of this. It's just all about powers coming to, to the Scottish Parliament. And the whole debate becomes more important because we are having more powers coming to us. Bill Scott, Inclusion Scotland. Just to address both Linda's and, and Maggie's points, um, the whole point of devolution is that different policies can be pursued in different parts of the UK. And divergence is therefore a natural consequence of that, that the policies will begin to diverge, for example, in how social care is provided in, in, the, in the different uh, parts of the UK. And over time, the divergence will become greater and greater. Um, so I, we are all for cooperation in those areas which remain UK, and we don't know what those are going to be yet. So that's why there's a bit of unanimity that what we have got has to work better, um, whatever, whatever powers rem remain now. But we also have to recognise that I would say the devolution has to go further than just down to local government level. I want to see devolution down at the level of local communities and people because, again, the Christie Commission, you know, all we've heard from that is you know, it's the service users who know how services need to work for them and they have to be involved as well. So, you know, the devolution process, as far as I'm concerned and as far as our organisation is concerned, isn't just about powers. It is about trying to give some of those powers taken from politicians and given to ordinary people to make decisions about how their, their lives uh, are conducted. Uh, Mark Pallard, last, very last yeah. on this continent. Um, <coughs> thank you. Um, Obviously, this is a commission looking at further Scottish devolution, but as I think Ian Gray highlighted, some of the solutions have to be UK-wide because they have to work not just for two parliaments, they have to work for all the parliaments and assemblies in the UK. The bedroom tax has been mentioned, and I think there's a really interesting case study at the moment in terms of the lack of proper formal structure in terms of the relationship between George Osborne and the Treasury and the Northern Ireland Assembly over the implementation of the bedroom tax in Northern Ireland. We, uh, as as Ian, Ian highlighted, we do have the joint ministerial committees. They're not well known. There is no sanction. There's no media coverage of what goes on in those committees. Having visible structures would mean that at least there was a sanction that came through um, the public awareness of failure to cooperate, even if there could be no legal sanction. So having visible structures that allow for the kind of complexities we've seen in Northern Ireland about the rollout of about uh, the bedroom tax and the, the wholly devolved Northern Ireland welfare system would enable some of those issues to be at least known about and examined publicly rather than in very, fairly unknown committees. I mean, it's hard, well, it's quite hard to imagine a situation in which meetings of the JMC became major events in the, the public mind, but the colleagues around the table engage much more with the machinery of government than, than the general public as part of the work that you do. How much awareness amongst you is there of joint ministerial committees and what they do? doesn't surprise me. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. We're moving on to the second section now, which is about uh, strengthening the financial accountability of the Parliament, and, and this covers things like tax revenue and uh, borrowing economic institutions um, and block funding and so on. Um, I wonder if I could just kick off uh, with a question to you, Ian Mackay, of the Institute of Directors, uh, because you've, uh, you're making a case for the uh, devolution of taxes which have localised improvement effects on local control and economic development, and you mentioned APD. Does that, does that um, purpose create a coherent set of, of tax changes in your view? I think that the, uh, I think the main purpose that we have is perhaps to get across the message that more is not necessarily better. More effective is better. But you know, I think that the Commission should be thinking in those terms and when it comes to look at taxation in, in particular. Uh, people will be aware that we have already got in line, coming down the pipeline, the changes in income tax from uh, the last Scotland Bill. I think an awful lot of SMEs in particular, when that hits, uh, are, are going to be uh, tumbling under the, the weight of it. Um, therefore, the last thing one wants to do is to add to co the complexity and the burden of uh, you know, varying taxation uh, regimes over the UK because 
you know, not only from the point of view of companies that are working solely in Scotland, but particularly for companies who are doing a lot of trading first of Scotland and, and across the UK as a whole. Uh, I think there's a, there's a point in, just in passing, um, picking up a little on what Linda was saying, generally speaking in business, uh, you know, making the status quo work actually is, is a wee bit closer to the reality. You know, the, the, you know, even when you make significant changes in companies and so on and turn around, you know, a, a slightly failing company into a, into a doing quite well company, it's more likely that the, a lot of it is about realignment and about making it work better rather than, you know, bulldoze the factory and start again type of thing. I mean, I, I think that is our experience of, of how one is going forward. So the low-lying fruit, as you say, are things like APD, is daft. I think a lot of Scottish businesses in particular find that because they have to hub through London, they end up paying a tax twice. Uh, there are things that we've, we've highlighted in our, our submission on uh, R&D uh, tax credits, uh, possibly in some of the oil-related, which again has a very significant local impact, and I think changes there could be very helpful to the way in which Scottish government is able to, to better manage uh, you know, its part of the economy. And the rest of us feel that there is a process of this level of governance here uh, being accountable for the money it spends you know, and the money it raises and so on. I think that is another big message on tax. But I think the main one that we'd be trying to get across is we have to think of tax not just in what can we shift, you know, Where's the office that we send the, the tax monies to? It's not that that matters. It's can we make sure that taxation is actually being effective in promoting productivity, in promoting startups, and promoting the ways in which business can actually grow here in Scotland as part of you know, that UK economy, European economy, and so on. I think that, that's the main message from us, is that we really don't want to see any more complexity in taxation we want to see something which is actually making it easier and smoother. But our private sector in Scotland is still too small. It has to be grown. And I think that is a job for, for both governments and indeed for local government and the rest of us who are involved in that. Thanks so much, Ian. Uh, Ross Martin from SCDI. With, with, with all of that, um, and make the point that um, it's the, the principle of and then the degree of subsidiarity which is built into the tax system. Um, and making sure that if there's, a, if there's a uniform impact of a tax across the UK, then it's appropriate that that tax is levied at that, at that level. But if there's a differentiated impact, and APD is a classic example, then that's obviously a candidate for, for, um, to be devolved out. Um, because the effect of levying that tax isn't necessarily understood at the UK level. And so the double hit, which Ian mentioned in terms of APD, is something which I'm sure wasn't built into the minds of the people putting that tax in place. Uh, but the impact that it has on Scottish business and its ability to trade in international markets is disproportionately high. And so that would certainly be a candidate for, for devolution. And if that principle and the, the impact and effect principle was taken throughout the system, then that would simplify the system rather than make it more complex, even though you could be bringing in layers of differentiation. OK, thank you. I'm going to open it up now for questions from the political uh, nominees. Uh, Linda. Yeah, in, in relation to uh, tax, you know, you know, as a starting point, I, I think, again, what, what motivates me is the idea of not just taking powers, you know, as Ian said, for the sake of it and saying we have power over this, but it's taking... Uh, a power so that that power then has a purpose and what you can achieve with that power. For me, it's about, uh, it, it ties in with everything. Um, welfare, of course, employability and all these things. And I would just like a general view um, from those who are here about you know, what would be really important for them in terms of entry to the employment market, the resultant effect on welfare, uh, productivity, and how we could use specific power uh, over tax, borrowing, uh, etc. Block grant, if you like, about how the mechanisms work for that, but generally what you would like to achieve and what you think can be achieved. So, so Linda, just to be clear, and we don't 
uh, getting straight into the third area. This mm -hmm. is about how tax can be used to promote those social goods, if you like, in terms of Yeah, but what, what I would say to you, Richard, is it's impossible not to look at it in the round or we're not doing our job properly. We're compartmentalising. Yeah. You know, therefore, um, I think, you know, there, there has to be a slight overlap. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, perhaps not, not okay. the full thing. Open we could lay down markers for the next part of the yeah. discussion. Uh, yes, Mike Thorne, please, from right. Oil and Gas. Uh, right, thanks. I represent uh, the oil and gas industry, which is a very active, obviously, a very active player here in Scotland. For us, it's around infrastructure, it's around skills, it's around allowing us the space to be a successful industry. Within Scotland, the vast contribution we make goes through the supply chain, the capability, which is everything from the very north of Scotland, from Wick right through to uh, probably even Gretna Green, has an inf impact from our industry here in, here in Scotland. And so infrastructure, the ability to, to access Aberdeen, not the peripheral bypass, which is great, but the ability for good trains, good air connection, good rail connection, all the things which make for a successful industry, allow us to access the resources in the central belt uh, and bring those, those, those knowledge and skills best to make sure we have a sustainable industry long past we've produced the last bar of oil from the North Sea. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Fraser Kelly from Social Enterprise Scotland. Richard, thank you. I, I suspect that um, some of our concerns are about the, the, the temporal nature of where you're looking in terms of the Commission and um, in terms of the way the, econo the economic base is structured. We think you need to have a 10, 20, 30, 40 year strategy around this. The economic base is broken. Um, it's not working as effectively as it should be. In terms of taxation, we think there are opportunities for you to act in favour of organisations that are ethical businesses. Now, if I use the example which is... Um, the Starbucks situation. We, when we all found out that Starbucks were not paying tax, we voted with our feet and we stopped buying their product. And very quickly, they decided that they would make a, a contribution to, towards the tax take. Um, I think we have to understand what people's decision making was around that in terms of acting not to buy the products of a company whom they felt were not behaving ethically and shift that emphasis to buying products from companies that do behave ethically. And I think there has to be something in the tax um, infrastructure which actually supports social enterprise as a business model of choice that makes it part of our future that sees the economic base structured in a different way. That's not anti-competitive in terms of the way that the business base is structured at the moment, but the social enterprise, i.e. businesses that trade goods and services and use the profits not for shareholder value, but to redistribute that back into solving social problems and community-based activity is a business of choice in the future, which makes this a more equitable economy than we have at the moment. That's not going to happen tomorrow. But I think the Commission has to set some clear guidelines about this being a 10, 20, 30, 40 year strategy which will achieve economic growth but a more socially just society. And I think taxation is one of the ways that you can actually do that. I would come back to Adam's comments at the start in terms of asking what legislation can we put in place. I would suggest, coming back to Michael's comment about a constitutional um, statutory right um, to be consulted is important because if I look at things like social investment tax relief at the moment, it is being railroaded through because there's a timetable that has to achieve it. HMRC and HM Treasury are likely to legislate on what a social enterprise is, i.e. create a definition for it within the UK, which is not compatible with our view in Scotland of what social enterprise actually looks like. So rather than actually say what legislation can we transfer at the moment, I think there's an obligation to say let's not put in place any other legislation until we know that it's been consulted on and been agreed across the constituent elements of the UK. Thanks, Fraser. Uh, uh, Michael and then uh, Mark Cruttall from Scottish Tourism Alliance. C can I make sure we're, we're getting some help with the specifics here, please? We, you know, Linda's talked about powers for purpose. Um, we've talked about accountability as a, as a driver of why it's important this parliament has more direct responsibility for taxation. Which powers, which taxes would help to influence the policy areas that you care most about or which would you be most allergic to us differentiating in Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom? So is it corporation tax, is it income tax? We've talked about APD, right, fine. We've got that message. Let's 
ask, you know, are we talking about capital gains tax and inheritance tax, and if so, why? Are we talking, what do you think of, is assignation of taxes sufficiently robust for you in terms of your wider concerns and policy agendas? Help us, if you wouldn't mind, focus on the rights and wrongs of individual taxes and the ways of devolving them. Um, Mark, can I bring you in from the Scottish Tourism Alliance and then Ross Martin and then Mary Taylor, please. Thank you um, for uh, say, having us here today. Um, obviously, if Michael, if, you've, if we've got APD, we'll, we'll be delighted with that as a tourism industry, particularly with the, uh, the growth uh, and the opportunity that's been highlighted in the Deloitte report, where tourism as an economy in Scotland, I think, is um, probably disproportionate uh, in terms of its uh, value and, and its contribution to jobs. Um, to, to the south, and therefore, you know, getting more people um, into Scotland is essential. Um, we also um, would be very uh, keen to see some uh, favourable moves towards the, the reduction of, of tourism VAT. It is a, a, a national uh, campaign that's being driven uh, by colleagues in the south, but uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, the, the reduction in VAT to, to make um, destinations more attractive and uh, also to allow businesses to thrive uh, is there as well as growing as well as growing uh, jobs too I think there are there are now just over a hundred MPs who are supporting that campaign um, and we would encourage it very definitely to uh, be driven through advert um, what yeah. what taxes well, I mean, I think there has to be a tax, and it's about reinvesting in the structure. So, you know, it's not about sort of taking it itself. It's about putting it back into the infrastructures of Scotland, ring fencing it, uh, and actually reinvesting in tourism growth and the economy to create more jobs. Um, how they are, are applied, I suppose, is, a, is, the, is the big question. Um, Ross Martin, SCDI. Our submission um, goes through that basket of taxes and, and makes our position clear on, on, on each of them. Um, so, for example, on VAT, then the assignation of VAT um, is about as far as we understand you can go, um, and so we, we make that point. Corporation tax, keep it as it is, um, and maintain the, uh, the integrity of the single market in that sense, and it goes through a range of those, those different taxes. And we also introduce um, some other ideas about specific taxes or tax incentives, um, which could be uh, considered, um, all against a backdrop of um, the, the, the powers for the purpose argument, Linda, uh, in terms of where we're at with the Scottish economy and, and what the structural failings of the Scottish economy and what have they been over the past 30, 40, 50 years against a backdrop of um, UK centralisation. You know, people have characterised it as the most centralised democratic state in the world. Um, and. And we made that point, and in, in, in fact, before I was born, SCDI was making that point. Um, and we, we make reference to that in, in our submission. And so looking at those, the key structural failings um, and weaknesses of the economy, lack of innovation, uh, lack of productivity, and lack of internationalisation, and that's the purpose to which you want to attach those powers, because they, they have been structural failings of the economy throughout those decades. Um, and so it is appropriate to talk about them and the impact that your um, your report will have uh, on on those specifics, and so one or two of the examples which we uh, which we raised in terms of oil and gas, uh, some of our oil and gas uh, members, and I'm sure uh, Mike was was involved in in these discussions, uh, make the point that if you look at the northeast and the economy of the northeast um, and the amount of tax revenue which the UK Treasury gets from the northeast, um, which is not insubstantial then there must be a mechanism by which you can improve the stickability of some of that money into the northeast infrastructure. And in particular, um, if you are wanting to tackle those issues about innovation and productivity and internationalisation, then being able to use some of that money on infrastructure to move people around, to supplement the jobs market, um, and uh, whether that's from uh, modern apprentice level right through to graduate level and, and beyond, then you need to link up and widen the catchment area of the jobs market in the North East and sweep in more of Scotland by sorting out some of the, the transport infrastructure. One mechanism we've suggested um, to do that um, is for oil and gas sector to have tax incentives um, to help fund some of that infrastructure. 
Um, and so to put in place mechanisms which would make that an attractive proposition so you can link up the national economy, which sits off the coast, and the local, the regional economy, which sits very much in the city centre and in and around Aberdeen. Um, that aspect hasn't been cracked. And if that same approach was taken to different parts of the economy, recognising the differentiated nature of the economy across the country, then individual tax incentives or, or variance in tax or devolution of tax uh, would certainly be applicable. Thanks very much, Ross. Mary Taylor from... Um, yes, I, th I think there are two points I'd like to make. Uh, one, one is around uh, welfare and the interface between welfare and taxation. Um, and we'll come on to welfare, so I'll just leave that to the side for the moment. But, but the, the, the crucial issue there is that uh, there, there is an interface. So if you want to take the social security powers, and that's the a position that we've argued, um, then the tax powers have to, the income tax powers have to come alongside it so that you can, you can make the interface work. Um, and so that you can uh, go back to the second point I wanted to make, which is about responsibility, which requires, we, we arrived at this principle through a process of dialogue with our members in the course of October. Um, and, and it took us to the principle, and I, I can just read it out to you, that it requires the responsibility, re responsibility requires the consequences of decisions to be borne by the decision makers rather than impacting on areas devolved or reserved to other jurisdictions. And that relates to how you fund social security rather than um, the, the, the operational interface for people in both paying tax and in receipt of benefits. Um, so I, I think those are both reasons for us why income tax um, needs to be part of, uh, of, of what is uh, devolved to Scotland. Thank you very much. Uh, John Downey, SCVO. Thanks, Richard. I mean, our headline point is obviously about you know, government at all levels must be fiscally accountable. But actually, I think picking up Mary's point about income tax, income tax on its own, uh, just involving that won't work because actually that's why we, we've very strongly stated that we must think about a portfolio of taxes because we're talking here about the interconnected nature of powers, policies and the taxation system is, is a good example of that where it hits in a whole range of different areas. And so I think that's where we need to look at so we're not placing a disproportionate burden on, on certain parts of the, the tax system or the tax tax base as well because redistribution is actually more difficult in Scotland with taxes because we don't have the big differentials perhaps we have in the south east between uh, earnings and wages and you know we've looked at this we've got the figures but being a bit specific as, as Michael said you know if you look at charity tax you know we have a you know a lot of information in that and, and we've got a couple of pages in our submission and what I'll see here is if income, if income tax is devolved, then we need to think about the consequences of that in terms of charities, for example. So we need tax reliefs over charitable donations, and this includes, as Fraser was talking about, social investment, gift aid, inheritance tax relief, because there's a natural knock-on knock consequence if you want, to, you want to have consistency. Now, if these were devolved to Scotland, we could actually design you know, a much better system of you know, charity tax relief that, that would actually, as Ross said, about for the private sector, would act as an incentive for charitable giving and actually for third sector organisations as well. And we touched on, for example, in our submission about the devolution of uh, VAT relief for charities. There's some technical issues around that would make it much easier for organisations to claim as well. So there are very technical points. They are there. Um, of course. Uh, yeah. uh, from John and perhaps others, when when you talk about um, income tax being devolved, uh, can you make the distinction of whether you mean just the right to operate the tax bans and, and keeping in income tax in the country, or whether you mean the reliefs, allowances, that then allows the point of entry to the workplace and that kind of thing? No, we, we're talking about in the, in the round. On the Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Maggie Chapman. Um, just actually off the back of that, if, um, Mary, Mary, you mentioned... Uh, some of the issues around inequality, John, John you've picked up on, on processes of redistribution and, and actually how, how complex they, they might be for Scotland. I wonder maybe, uh, Margaret, if you could say a little bit about some of, some of the, the, the issues you have around the devolution of tax and how, what kinds of things, taking on board what John has said about the difficulties with income tax, but how, how we actually get to a position then where we can do something about the gross inequality and the poverty that, that we are seeing in, in Scotland, because we maybe don't have the range or 
as many, many people at the top end, should I say, in, in, in Scotland as, as the South East, but we clearly have a significant problem around poverty and inequality. And I, th I think I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in, in hearing some, some fleshed out ideas from you on this. Yeah, I hate to disappoint you, but we decided that tax was above our pay grade. It was horribly mm -hmm. complex, not something that we understood, and that silence sometimes is better than uh, kind of ignorance uh, bruited abroad. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's out with our area of expertise or competence, and I prefer only to speak where all find Okay, them. thanks very much. Yeah. I'll bring in uh, Ian Mackay from Institute of Directors. Yes, and then Bill Scott. Yes. I'm reminded that you know, often of Mr. Clinton's phrase, it's the economy, stupid. And, that, and you know, that we sometimes get awfully far away from that. The, I think the point has been well made that. In order, you know, if you're going to have re redistributive policies and so on, you've got to have something to redistribute. And our, our current economic structure within Scotland does not really lend itself to that. Um, you know, you've got to have to give, and we don't have. And I think that was, you know, the main thrust of what we were trying to say is that if we are going to see Scotland having more command over its own economy and the, you know, the key parts like taxation within its own economy then we have to, you know, in a sense, uh, do those things which are going to be most effective in, in growing towards that area. Now, I take Michael's point that one wishes to identify particular taxes and so on. And during the referendum campaign, there was lots of talk about, you know, a tax that would make jobs or not make jobs and so on. Life is rarely quite so simple as that. Uh, what we find, uh, those of us and I think it's the same with third, uh, third sector organisations, private sector, public sector. We have to deal with the world in the round. We have to deal with all of the various things which change whether or not we're going to be successful. And it's that last point of being successful which actually is the one that matters. So if you were asking specifics, Michael, no, don't devolve VAT. Just leave it alone uh, because it's really quite complicated just now and we don't really want it becoming more complicated. Corporation tax, there's been a big debate about that. My colleagues in IOD in Ireland, north of Ireland, would argue that they would want it because they have a very specific circumstance of having to deal with the south of Ireland. Um, here in Scotland, we have not supported that as a view because we don't think that a race to the bottom is, is actually particularly helpful uh, towards uh, business in the longer term. Um, on the other hand, we have outlined three or four individual taxes, and I think... Um, you know, Ross was also uh, alluding to the fact that they have identified taxes that we could actually take as, as the low-hanging fruit that would make an, an immediate impact. But what matters is what we're using those taxes for. There is absolutely no point in pretending that by giving a tax, you know, or control over a tax, that somehow or other we can move the economy forward if, with the other hand, we're taking away the ability of people to do that, which is why in our paper we've stressed that the discussion on tax also has to look at things like economic development, the way in which different measures you know, are coming together in the round on this, uh, rather than it being seen as, you know, how many things can I put in my shopping bag here? Because that ain't what it's about and it shouldn't be what it's about. And just one last point, Chair. Or two very, very small ones. Um, it is possible to reduce taxes. Don't forget that. It should be possible for us to have the power to reduce taxes as well as increase taxes. That would, that's an idea to work with. And, but most of all, simplicity. The number one thing that we get from our members, and I'm sure if the uh, Federation of Small Businesses and people were here as well, they would echo, and indeed I'm sure the third sector would echo, is that the red tape and the bureaucracy around taxes and allowances and so on of all kinds is the bane of ordinary small businesses and large businesses' lives. It stops good things happening. So the more that can be done in Scotland to make that a less complex system, the better. Uh, time for two succinct comments, one from Bill Scott and the final one from Mark Thorne, please, before we move on to the final section. Yeah, um, I'm going to echo uh, Margaret. Um, we are no experts on tax. Um, what we are experts on is inequality. Um, and there is massive inequality that disabled people experience and also many other people on low incomes in Scotland. And to address that, you need the full box of tools. You, know, you, you, you cannot, on the one hand, say we'll have welfare spe uh, you know, 
uh, welfare benefits with no means of raising additional monies at some point to supplement that spend. If, and, and, and I could echo Ian, you, you might decide to invest that in getting people into work so that you raise your, 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 your tax revenue that way. I mean, the problem being that you know, we, we've managed to get a lot of people into work in the last six years uh, since the beginning of the recession, uh, but only one in 40 of those jobs are full-time jobs. And because of the, the tax breaks that have been created for the low paid, the tax revenue coming in is nowhere near what the Treasury expected, with you know, employment revels returning in near what they were before the recession started. So you know, there's, it's not just tax, but we need, we need to think of it in the round. If, if we want to tackle wealth inequalities in this country, we need to have the full box of tools. Mike Thorne, last comment. Uh, I'd like to build on what Ian said. Um, we sit within an industry that has a continuum north and south of the border between Scotland and England, around the UK, and we need the freedom of operation that a tax regime that works right through the UK delivers to allow us to make the best we can of those opportunities. Uh, and it's not just for taxes, for regulation as well. What we'd hate to see happen is that we have artificial barriers that prevent us delivering the best we can for the value for the Scottish economy and, yes, the UK economy onshore from those activities offshore. So a continuum offshore certainly allows us to do the best onshore and, and preferably with the least regulatory and most transparent tax regime we can get right across the UK. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right, now the final session, sec session is on prosperity, growth and social justice, which is a huge range of things, as I said, from, from welfare through to, through, through to broadcasting. Um, I want to kick off uh, with a question to Paul to Paulette, please, from Ingius. Paul, I think uh, Ingius didn't put in their own submission, but they contributed to the one from URSA, the uh, Employment Re Related Resource Association, uh, Service Association. And just to remind people of the two main uh, comments made there, one was uh, seeking the devolvement of responsibilities for all employment support services, Job Centre Plus, and outsourced support for long-term unemployed and people with disabilities, and devolution of all in-work and out-of-work welfare policies and benefits. Now, I know um, in just didn't necessarily agree with the whole of that submission, but I wonder if you could just pick up and explain to us, uh, you know, what's the problem that those kind of things are trying to tackle? Okay, thanks, uh, Richard. Yeah, I, I th we, we operate in... Uh we operate in over a dozen countries around the world. We operate in many countries in Europe and, and also places as diverse as Saudi Arabia and uh, South Korea. And we, we work for many different levels of government. We deliver employment and skills policies and outplacement policies for national government, for regional government, for local government. And also in some countries, like Switzerland, we deliver it for uh, insurance companies who are the social protection provider in those environments. Our, our view would really be that uh, the level that you uh, deliver the policy at isn't necessarily the most important factor. It's actually what you do uh, with those policies and how you then encourage it to achieve the aims that are expected. Uh, some of the points that Bill's made, I think, are kind of quite pertinent. You know, we talk about uh, devolution meaning divergence, and I think there's a general kind of point there that I would make that you need to be able to and willing to accept the level of divergence that occurs across the board in devolving policies. So if we talk about devolving employability policies and skills policies right down to a local level, we then need to accept that what that will mean is that what people get in one place, they might not get in another. And what employers get in one place, they might not get in another. And you know, one, of, one of the key points that was made at, at one of the sessions we were at last week is that it isn't employability organisations or skills providers or the third sector, by and large, that give significant levels of jobs to people who are out of work. It's employers. And therefore, making things easy for employers is, is, is a key part. Uh, the level that you do, I think, also uh, is, is important from the point of view of uh, defining very clearly what the policy objective is. So if the policy objective uh, is not being met, and the point that, that Bill made there in terms of people moving into work since the recession, but that's not necessarily impacting on the tax revenues that we're seeing, then the challenge for us going forward there is how you simply create a clear view of what the policy is there to do, and then align that to what the services that are uh, delivering that achieve. So the programme that we deliver at the moment for the UK government, the work programme, uh, that's essentially paid for uh, out of the tax revenues that are generated uh, through savings and benefits. So if we move people into work and keep them there, we're successful. If we don't, then we're not. Uh, one of the challenges for us going forward, I suppose, is, is, is how we think about how we align those policy objectives. So one of the examples we was given at the session we were at last week was that if you're talking about work and employability being a way to alleviate poverty, then how do you hardwire that into the measures and the metrics that you expect of programmes? 
So, for instance, if, if, if a government at any level was to decide that a living wage is a political imperative, then you hardwire that into the outcomes. You measure the success achieved in moving into jobs that achieve a living wage. Uh, those are the things that you can actually do through sensible procurement, through aligning the expectations that you expect of the delivery of that service to what the policy intent is in the first place. Okay. Uh, if I can open that up for questions, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start off. I'd like to, to pick up on something that Ian said about um, simplicity, <coughs> uh, ease of use, and things becoming overcomplicated. And it strikes me as, as a, you know, someone who um, deals with people going through the kind of systems we're talking about, that in this particular subject we could do with an awful lot more simplicity and ease of use. Um, two quick examples: you know, when you look at apprenticeships, job entry. You've got European Union stuff, Scottish Government stuff, local authority stuff, Westminster stuff, through the DWP, through the Council. It is so confusing for the client, for the employer. I've had employers in my own area who say, oh, I can't be bothered with it, it's, it's just all too difficult. Especially small and medium enterprises who could benefit very much from some of these programmes uh, in terms of the whole community development. It also ties in with... Um, the discussion we had earlier about um, interfaces between the different governments. I mean, as a, an elected MSP, I am frequently given a row for interfering in reserve matters. That would be helping people trying to get enough money to eat for the weekend, for example. Um, so I, I would like the view on how we can really boost um, productivity, jobs, getting young people into apprenticeships, by a level of simplification and whether making the responsibility for all of that rest in Scotland and being more transparent could in fact make a difference. I think it's a really, really good point. The, the challenge that we face is that, that we, we spend at the moment somewhere in the region of £650 million a year on areas of employability and skills in Scotland. Uh, not all of that uh, comes uh, from, from, from Westminster. I think probably around about 35 to 40 percent of that comes from Westminster funded programmes. Many of it, much of it comes from Europe, much of it comes from the Scottish Government and its various agencies. Uh, the work programme accounts for less than 10 percent of that. Uh, and the challenge that we face, I suppose, is that at a kind of macro level, we don't really know what we get for that. Uh, there isn't a framework there that tells us, uh, are we getting value for money? Are the various plethora of programmes that operate across the board delivering what they're intended to? Uh, do we know what good, bad and indifferent looks like? Uh, and, and I think that, that's, that's long been recognised as a challenge. And, and one of the, kind of the cross-governmental organisations, the Scottish Employability Forum, had, has commissioned a piece of work to look at uh, trying to map that out and, and trying to make some sense of that. And, you know, whatever level of government you're at, you know, we need to aspire to, to having a, a clearer view of what that actually is and how well it works together and identifying where the blockages are. Because for service users, be those clients or be those employers, it kind of needs to be more simple. It needs to be more straightforward. And people, you know, should not feel that, uh, that they are too long-term unemployed to access a certain type of thing or that they can't ac access something because they happen to live in the long area. That's not particularly conducive to moving people forward and, into a better place. Um, Michael Moore and then Mark Ballard. Yeah, there are a lot of different things in the submissions and in the discussions that we've been holding so far that are grappling with the different elements of the welfare state. My sense, to stand to be corrected, is that uh, notwithstanding people's individual positions or party positions, there is a, an acceptance that pensions will probably or ought to remain at a UK-wide level. Be interested to understand how, if, if in that by that we mean pensions and pensioner benefits, like winter fuel allowance and, and all that kind of stuff that gets added on the side. There's then that whole sphere of issues from child benefit through disability benefits and so on, which, at one level, you might argue could be devolved because it's reasonably predictable, it's complementary to a lot of Scottish policy making that we already do here in this Parliament. On that scale, perhaps candidates for devolution. Then you look at the working age, uh, predominantly working age benefits on universal credit and the big debate about that. Do you devolve the whole thing? Do you devolve none of it? 
do you try and, do I say, girdle around in the complexities in the middle? Um, where do job centres fit into that? Do they come north as part of, to run the UK system, but to be better integrated into the work that the Scottish Government does in the skills and employment agenda? perhaps accepting that that then leads on to the work program being devolved. Whatever. So different kind of models, we're all grappling with them at the moment, but it's quite interesting territory for us. It'd be great to get a kind of feel of where on those big chunky bits, if there are any no-nos or, or areas where you think it, this is absolutely a given, we have to have this to move things on. Uh, Mark, you may have been wanting to talk about the simplicity of the landscape, but, but please come in now and, and perhaps pick up on some of Mark Hamill's points as well. So, if Michael Moore set out three options, one of which was devolve all of it in terms of working age benefits, one of which was devolve none of it, and one of which was grapple with the complexities. From the point of view of the children, young people and families we work with, the worst outcome would be to increase the complexity. And the, I think there are good examples which would back up what, what Paul said in terms of the existence of the, the experience of in terms of um, employability, training and skills, devolution meaning mixed responsibility, where we have uh, young people who are on the work programme who want to access um, things that are in the employability, uh, the, on the Skills Development Scotland Employability Fund who can't shift between one kind of support and another. And that makes no sense to them. It no, makes no sense to the Bernardo's advisor working with them. And it's purely because of a disconnect between a Westminster mm -hmm. Job Centre Plus system and a Holyrood um, SDS system. That makes no sense if the policy intention is to move that young person into employment. And that's the reality. So, so I think the worst outcome would be to increase the complexity. We already have a very difficult situation for the young people we work with that I described earlier, where on the one hand they can access a welfare fund which comes from the local authority, on the other hand they can access a hardship fund that comes from Job Centre Plus. And it makes no sense again to that young person that you have two different sets of forms, two different questions, two different remits. They, they just need support now because they've not got any money. And what we want to see is a, more, is a more coherent system. We believe this should be one of the principles that the Smith Commission looks to, where you have areas where devolution has... Um, the experience of devolution has been mixed responsibility. Can we move to a simpler set of responsibilities from the point of view of the people who need to access those kinds of public support? Thank you very much. Mary Taylor. Uh, yeah, I, I would echo that point. It relates to housing benefit, and I'll not go into the details of all of that, but I know that a lot of people around the third sector have commented on the, the scope for housing benefit to be devolved on its own, which would actually complicate matters further, potentially. No, Northern Ireland has come up a couple of times, and I'm going to refer to it again. What, what Northern Ireland has around social security is devolution, but it's devolution on terms that make it impossible for them to do anything with the powers uh, that they have, or, or virtually nothing with the powers that they have uh, without paying a penalty. So the, the situation at the moment is that the Assembly government, even without taking a bedroom, bedroom tax, uh, failure to implement bedroom tax in Northern Ireland into account, is paying fines of £7 million a month to the UK government for failure to make savings on what the, on what, um, the UK government, the Treasury, thought that the GB policies applied in Northern Ireland would produce. I think that came out the way I intended it to. So we do it. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. Um, Thanks very much, Mary. Uh, so the, the point that I would, I would put back to Michael and colleagues on the Commission is, what do you mean by devolution? Is it just about the administration of things where policies and powers are just... Uh, the power to decide on policy is made elsewhere? Or are you talking about um, the power to... Uh, a, a devolution in the form of the opportunity to define policies and systems and administer those in a way that would be appropriate to the situation that we face, with the fiscal responsibility to go with it? Okay. Um, can I, can I, yes, can of course. I follow you can. That, that point of course, with Mary, because um, a couple of colleagues have talked about um, the relationship between the responsibilities and the fiscal responsibility to actually fund it. But 
um, Bill made the point, Ian made the point as well, that within that, you, ha you have to have, you have to have the, 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 but you have to have something there to redistribute in order to, to make the kind of shifts and interventions that we're describing. So you don't think there's a danger here then that if we shift the responsibility, and Ian made the point that to redistribute in Scotland is quite difficult because uh, we're smaller and perhaps the less people at the higher end of the income range. But is the danger there not that what, you act, what we actually achieve is, um, yes, that responsibility, yes, that capacity to act, but actually reduce the resources that we've, we've got to deliver the outcomes that we're looking for? I wouldn't disagree that that's a danger. Um, that there's nothing safe or certain in any of this at all. I think we're in uncharted waters. Um, but, but if coherence is one of the things that we're after, and that, that's a word that's come up a lot in the dialogue that I've been involved in across the spectrum in, during October while people were gathering their thoughts to put submissions to you all. Um, co coherence is absolutely key, and what we need to end up with is something which is simple to operate, can be funded sustainably, and is coherent. Uh, John Downey from SCVO and then Ian Mackay from Institute I think I'm, I, I strongly agree with both uh, Mark and Mary. It is, a, it is about that coherence. Michael, just having the Job Centre Plus, you know, working more, more closely with Scottish Government and the Love and the Work Programme in Scotland or the Scottish Government doing that just won't work. We, we do need that integration. And, that comes, and that's why the third sector has been saying this for the past two years. It's, it's an easy thing for us. It's not political. It's just about integration, delivering a, you know, a better service for the client. But I think Ian's point, I think it, it is well made. Yes, there's, there's lots of dangers with potentially devolving more powers, but that, I don't think that's a reason for stopping us doing that, because actually that's about the choices that, is, that are made in this Parliament after the event. It's how, as Ian says, we grow the economy. And making a point on the economy, the fact is more inequality in the economy gives you a weak economy. Less inequality, you get a stronger economy. You can, you can look at what's happening in the United States at the moment where you know, they seem to have got this now. JP Morgan had a recent report, Standard & Poor, actually the price of inequality uh, on, the UK, uh, on the US economy is actually a drag on it. And actually it's a drag on the Scottish economy. So we need to find a way of actually addressing poverty and inequality at the same time exactly of uh, growing our private sector. And so we can actually think about how we re redistribute wealth and actually change things. And it's linked very closely to us about the conversation we had earlier about democracy and choices and what people are able to decide for themselves. So I think we, we need to see this in a different picture. There's always dangers, Ian, and we've had members who have said to us, you know, uh, we want wholesale devolution of uh, welfare and employability, but we want to know what the system will be like. And my, my response is, well, that's up to us to lobby the Scottish Parliament to get the system that we, we want in place. It's actually, as Bill said, is based on the principles of Christie. That's our job after the fact. It's not a reason to stop doing something that there might be potential uh, dangers. If it can be demonstrated that one facet of the system is you'll reduce the resource that's available for it, that, that surely is not desirable. But then, it, it may not be desirable in the short term, but then you know, in the longer term, if we grow our economy, we can actually say, with potential different changes to the tax system, we can actually grow the income we have in Scotland compared to that. So you have to... I, I don't think... There's not an easy answer to that. I mean, it's a bit like, I would say, some of our members who you know, want wholesale devolution of certain things, but they don't want it to affect the Barnet consequentials, which, frankly, is probably impossible, despite... You know, it, it, so there is going to be changes to expenditure and income, but I think, in a Scottish Parliament, I think the debate is happening the next year for us will be around, let's take health in Scotland. We t we've got a medical model that we're throwing money at that isn't working. We're not doing the transfer of resources to move to a preventive model, and the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government is going to have to grapple with that transfer of resources next year. And there's debates like that that are linked to this that we have to have. Ian McKay. I'm pleading Margaret's uh, uh, clause here that says, you know, you really should talk about the things that you know about. And IOD is not a, a benefits and welfare organisation, but I think the areas, as has come out from others, the areas that we are concerned with are very much affected by those, those areas. Um, and I think certainly it would be helpful perhaps for the Commission to be seeking to uh, streamline or focus what is 
by its very nature an enormously complicated and complex thing into perhaps where that great gormenghast of a structure can be moved towards a particular outcome. I mean, in, in our own case, we would point you towards things like employability and the ability to bring people into work, for example, as being something which is helpful to at least you know, see where all of those various other things can be focused in that way. But can I perhaps make just one very simple thing um, and, and answer also Michael's point? If, if we do have to think about not just, you know, do pensions move, do benefits move and so on, what happens to the add-ons, there is, an, of course, another way of doing that. Stop having the add-ons, you know. <laughs> don't have allowances which add on to basic pensions, just increase the basic pensions and give people the, a wee bit more um, economic power generally instead of, instead of doing it in, a, in an overly complex way. But the, the main point I was going to make was that perhaps what the Commission could do is try and give all of us in the UK, including Scotland, some clarity about data. If you look at, you know, we're talking here about comparabilities and whether it's better here or better there and so on. If you look, I mean, Joe Armstrong did a piece, I think, about 10 years ago, comparing the NHS in the different parts, different devolved administrations and so on. You can't compare them because they use different data, because the data isn't comparable one to the other. We have the same problem in aspects of education. The whole Barnett formula remains and nobody wants to deal with it because it would require a massive needs assessment right across the whole of the UK with one, you know, <coughs> agreed formulation as to how we do it. And it's the lack of that data, I think, which makes it very difficult. So it may well be a useful outcome to this enterprise and to others that we at least agree somewhere in the UK to actually when we're discussing apples, discuss apples and not apples and compare them with pears and get that data sorted out. Because at the moment we have different regimes using different data which actually stop us then from doing the things that we'll then all fall out about uh, and, we and it doesn't give us a rational basis of, of discussing it. Yes, CAS deals with um, people who have about 350,000 problems, if you like, with welfare, uh, walk through our doors every, every year. And we've got, I think, a very real appreciation of how both government policy and the manner in which that policy is implemented can have you know, really devastating impacts on people's lives. And it was for that reason that, on a balance, you know, weighing it all up, we decided to argue in the Smith Commission for the devolution of all welfare benefits, with the or all social security benefits, with the exception of pensions, to um, to Scotland. However, I think our concern is that when you consider that it was seven years ago that the UK Parliament legislated for the introduction of universal credit, and that hasn't really happened in its fullest extent. It was five years ago when um, the uh, PIP was introduced, and not everybody, in fact, very few people have migrated um, across to that. I think that what we want to do is just introduce, we want to nudge the Smith Commission to a reality check on just how complex a policy area this is and how devastating the consequences can be if you rush to judgment and, you know, like, you know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And that's not to say that we shouldn't have a debate about it. It probably is to say that, you know, whilst we would absolutely are not arguing for an extension of the timetable um, that Smith has been set, what we are arguing is that Smith goes back to the government and says, do you know what, the welfare bit of this is trickier than we had originally envisaged, and we would like more time to have a more considered discussion around about it. The reason that I argue that, for example, is that although CAS has taken a position... For that though. Well, you know, although CAS has taken a position, and we have, we recognise that that position is subject to challenge. And if you look at the point that Ian has been making, there is a very strong argument, I would concede, that, you know, disability benefits might devolve to Scotland, but, you know, given that the economy is subject is, is cyclical, uh, because we know that, because John Maynard Keynes told us that a long time ago, that maybe the pooling and sharing of that level of risk might be better held at a UK level. Now, what I want is 
you know, we, we're, we're not resiling from our position, but what we're saying is that all of this needs to be properly tested. And at the moment, there's not the time, you know, in this process to allow for that. So what we're asking for is that Smith goes back to the government and says, there's more to this than meets the eye. Can we report after the general election in 2015 on the kind of um, a more you know, a more, a more detailed uh, a, a approach to this because that is safer in policy terms um, and it's less likely to do to do harm. Mark, very quick uh, uh, comment, please, because um, I'm very keen to make a, take advantage of having Colin Anderson with yeah, us in terms a, of broadcasting. A, a couple of quick comments. The first was um, that when we talk about why devolve, why devolve welfare and why it would make sense to have... Um, the whole of adult working age benefits devolved. It's partly because of other things that the Scottish Parliament has done, such as the Getting It Right for Every Child programme, started under the Labour Lib Dem coalition, now continued by the SNP. And one of the comments I hear frequently from our staff when they talk about the successes of Getting It Right for Every Child is that it has brought so many of the agencies that are there to support vulnerable children and families together but there's one agency which isn't there, which can't engage as fully as it should, and that's Job Centre Plus. And it's the decisions that are taken at Job Centre Plus which have a huge effect on all the other people around the table. The second thing is, um, just to highlight, that my understanding is that welfare spending would not go through the Barnet formula because it's annually managed expenditure. And I know there are people with far more expertise on that at the other end of the table, but trying to unpick some of the complexities, as Margaret talked about, of potentially a Westminster benefit cap on AME expenditure and how that related to the ability of a devolved parliament to influence welfare spending. And, and these things are very difficult to, to grapple with, but I think there's an important thing about remembering who the welfare system is there to support. Um, I'm very keen that the political nominees have an opportunity to hear from Colin Anderson. Colin runs a small company called, multimedia company, I think, called Denko. Um, I think you've put forward some views about uh, devolution in the area of broadcasting. I wonder if you could just take us through the opportunities you think there may be around that, Colin. Certainly. Thank you very much. Just to be clear, I'm actually, I work in the interactive sector, so I'm not a broadcast expert. I actually represent Taiga, which is the, the Independent Game Developers Association. And the reason that broadcast has come to our attention is because it's very clear to us that these two areas are starting to significantly overlap. It's already clear from services such as BBC iPlayer and 4OD, these sort of things, but looking ahead, we can see that this is going to continue significantly over the coming decades. So as part of that, I was involved, uh, I was invited by the Scottish Broadcast Council to report on something back in about 2010, I think it was, which was the, the idea of a Scottish digital network. Now, at the moment, if you are interested in any sort of broadcast media, as a, as a member of the Scottish public, you know exactly where to go. You go to the BBC and you, are, you will be guaranteed to find the best examples of broadcast media that we have to offer within our society at the moment. There is no such example of that within interactive media. And up until now, it hasn't really been a significant issue because interactive media has primarily been a hobbyist niche area. But as we've seen with the proliferation of smartphones and tablet devices, interactive media is quickly becoming a mainstream significant event. So what, what we reported on was this idea of a Scottish digital network that could provide that focus for interactive media in Scotland. Now, that was reported on in 2010. It was adopted as a policy by the, the ministers at the time as a, as a great idea that we should go forward with. But five years later, it hasn't been implemented. And I think this is a really good example of where a very specific idea that has, has been adopted can hit the buffers. There are different reasons that are given for that, depending on, on whom you speak to, of course. But essentially, one of the, the key things that seems to be blocking it 
is the way that broadcasting is currently operated within the UK and funded. Because in the first instance, everyone agrees it would be a great idea to have a system like this. The next question is, how do we get to it? So because broadcasting is controlled, the priorities for it are controlled primarily from Westminster, we believe that needs to be distributed across the rest of the UK so that areas such as Scotland, which does have innovative ideas to offer, can be part of that discussion. And similarly, for the, the funding as well, so that whatever is raised in the UK can also be directed, not just simply to agencies within territories, but through representatives of the people in that area in order to bring that back for the benefit of those people. And uh, that is our time. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming along and uh, explaining your views with the political nominees. Um, just to say that uh, after January the 25th, when the draft clauses are published, the UK government will be engaging in a consultation process, so there'll be an opportunity then uh, to further contribute to the finalisation of those draft clauses. But thank you very much indeed for coming, um, and safe journey home. Thank you.